Thank you very much, Madam, and thank you to the Medicinal Subcommittee of the SLMA for giving me this opportunity. And today, I would be uh, giving you an update on therapeutics on the management of anxiety disorders. Today, what we are experiencing, the uncertainty, the fear, the concerns that we have, mm -hmm. it's almost like as if there is a threat in front of us. There are so much, so many number of threats which are, uh, which we have to face now. So that causes anxiety. And let's see what anxiety, anxiety disorder, and also what management options are there for us to uh, get over these problems. Uh, before I move on to the uh, presentation proper, I want you to go through these case scenarios. Forget about the fact that this has been delivered by a psychiatrist. Just if you are a general practitioner or a physician or a uh, house officer or a senior house officer, registrar, senior registrar at a medicine, surgical or obsangin ward, just think of where you are and if these patients come to you, what would you have done? This is the case scenario number two. A medical student gets anxious closer to the exams. And the case scenario number three, 30 year old male presents to the ETU complaining of shortness of breath and racing heartbeat. Case scenario number four, an eight year old child presents with nocturnal enuresis for three months duration. And the last one, a 30 year old newly married man presents with erectile dysfunction. So these patients come to you and what would you have done? How would you manage the above patients? Just have a think about it and we'll come back to the case scenarios later on. So now getting moving on to the proper anxiety, anxiety disorders and therapeutics. What's stress response? So when there is a threat to our lives or when there is a threat, just like today or these days that we are experiencing, the stress response comes into play. And then the fight, flight or freeze mechanism comes into play. So the, there would be increased heart rate, the, the, the bronchioles will get dilated, the muscles will tighten. So that's the stress response, which you all know. So when you have a stressor and the body would experience certain psychological uh, features like uh, fearful anticipation. Now, when we are in the petrol queue, we are like fearfully anticipating what will happen to us, whether there'll be petrol. And then we would be worrying if we are running short of petrol, we would be worrying what if our uh, child gets sick? What if our parents get sick? And, and most of all, how are we going to come into work tomorrow? So the psychological uh, factors will come into play. And then the autonomic features. Just when we get closer to the petrol queue, the heart beats, beats fast and you get a little short of breath because you know the petrol might run out just as you enter the petrol shed. So the autonomic features will come in and then the muscle tension, features of muscle tension like headache, backache, those features are there. Sleep issues. You wouldn't fall asleep, particularly if there is anxiety, you are worrying about it all the time and you find it difficult to sleep. So uh, difficulty in falling asleep is a feature of anxiety and hyperventilation, which is actually a consequence of uh, rapid um, breathing. So those are anxiety features than one that one would experience. And mind you, these could happen even if there is a normal threat in front of us. 
So a normal reaction to stress or difficult times is anxiety. And this is the body's response. And this is not always pathological. Like if we are uh, about to face an exam in a week's time and we don't have a little amount of stress, we wouldn't be studying at all. But if these symptoms are overwhelming and we cannot go on with our day-to-day -day life and our life is getting disrupted and we are distressed and dysfunction, then that becomes a disorder. So the same symptoms are there, but they do not go away once the stressor is gone away, but it causes dysfunction. Then it becomes anxiety disorder. Although we use this anxiety disorder, the term, it's actually an umbrella because there are certain, certain uh, subcategories which falls under anxiety disorders. So the symptoms of anxiety to a level with an impact is there. If the feeling of increased heart rate, shortness of breath, and always having headaches, the features of muscle tension, and you're worrying all the time, if that is cont continuous, then we call that generalized anxiety disorder. I will tell you later on how it is very important on therapeutics. So if it is continuous anxiety, most of the time of the day, in, on most days of the week, then it's generalized anxiety disorder. You're worrying about everything. Then if that anxiety is intermittent and is not always there, and it is arising in a particular circumstance, like, you know, a spider or within a lift. There is a particular stimulus and you're getting anxiety symptoms secondary to that stimulus or the situation. Then it's called phobic anxiety disorder. And you have anticipatory anxiety about uh, thinking of a spider also, and you don't want to go in an elevator and you avoid it as much as possible. And if there is a spider, you would be on top of the chair. So there is an exaggerated response of anxiety, which is the phobic anxiety disorders. And depending on the type of anxiety, phobia you have, we have social anxiety where in social situations where the person can be observed or scrutinized, you get anxiety symptoms. And when you're away from home and in crowds and cannot leave easily, you get agoraphobia. And the specific phobias I talked to you about, that is the um, spiders and the elevators. So that's the phobic anxiety disorder. But let's say without a spider, without being in the lift, Without a real stimulus, if you get episodes of anxiety, like intermittent anxiety, then that is called a panic attack. And if you get it regularly to a point that you cannot uh, carry out with your day-to-day -day functions, that's panic disorder. So it's very important that we know because we have a tendency to diagnose anxiety and then do certain types of uh, uh, management uh, ways, and then that might not be addressing the real issue. Um, so just like anxiety can be a normal uh, phenomena, not all anxiety disorders have to be treated. It could be a mild one, transient one, without associated impairment, so you don't have to do anything actually. However, if it is if it has worsened to a degree where the patient needs treatment and with the treatment that is available, 60 to 85% of the patients with anxiety disorders respond. And uh, here we mean by response, what we mean is 50% improvement. And only about 50% of the responders will achieve recovery though. So they only about 50% will go to the minimum residual symptom status. And the other thing is, most of the time, anxiety disorders are comorbid with most of the time depression and it can co-occur with other uh, uh, comorbidities like, let's say, alcohol use disorders and so on, as well as other physical comorbidities, let's say diabetes, angina, and so on. 
Um, and if a patient is not responding to whatever that you have been given, giving them, it could be that there is misdiagnosis. And also it could be the patient's problem, like, you know, poor adherence to treatment. It could be because of substance use, a common comorbidity. And as I mentioned earlier, because of depression. So the moving on to the therapeutics part of it, the treatment actually depends on the diagnosis. Whether, so we can't be going by the general term anxiety disorder. It has to be whether it's generalized anxiety disorder or phobic anxiety disorder or panic disorder. So diagnosis is very, very important. And the risks involved. How, how um, is the patient's life affected because of this illness? So the risk, sometimes if this has led to a depression, there might be suicidal ideas. So that needs to be corrected. And the severity, because the mild forms might not need any treatment. The treat, transient ones might not need any treatment. And also uh, mild to moderate uh, severe, uh, uh, severity of anxiety disorders can be managed with cognitive behavior therapy and so on. So the treatment modality that we might be choosing will depend on the severity as well and the comorbidities. Let's say if the patient is having depression, we might have to treat the patient vigorously there. Patient preference, why I have put it here is, now let's say it's a moderate degree of generalized anxiety disorder. And if the patient is willing, the patient can be managed with cognitive behavior therapy alone. And given that the patient is committed because cognitive behavior therapy, at least weekly sessions, which runs for about 12 weeks. So patient's uh, commitment is very, very important. Let's say a patient who is, uh, happens to be a university student might not be able to engage with their homework and all the exercises that we are doing. If the patient is in the hostel, it might not be really practical. So be, depending on the patient preference, commitment, the treatment modality might change because in that case, giving a medication might be practical. And the social support systems, most of the, uh, some of the patients might not think that this is actually an illness. So therefore, uh, there might, uh, it's good to have somebody from a family member to administer the medications and so on. And sometimes we need a co-therapist for the behavioral techniques because sometimes we might not be in Sri Lanka in, has not developed to that level where the occupational therapist or the psychiatrist or the psychologist can go to the home front and do carry out the behavioral techniques there. So social support systems are very, very important as well when we decide on what we are going to give the patient. So the management is according to the biopsychosocial um, model. And because they're important, I'll just go through, uh, because the management, the medications are actually involved uh, in all this. So the genetics is important. The rates of anxiety disorders among uh, twins is high. And the neurostructures, we know that amygdala, thalamus, hippocampus, somatosensory cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, they are involved in anxiety disorders. And the neurotransmitters that are uh, implied are noradrenaline, serotonin, GABA. So the medications that we would be using, which I'll be discussing later on, are actually targeting this uh, noradrenaline, the sympathetic system the serotonin. Uh, most of the medication that we would be using in anxiety disorders are actually uh, serotonin related. And uh, when we are using, uh, let's say, psychological methods, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, the behavioral techniques, amygdala, the learning systems, all these are very, very important. The psychological factors, cognitive factors. Now, these days, we feel as if we are out of control, that we don't have any control over the petrol or the gas or how the country is running. So therefore, perceived lack of control, and we tend to overestimate the threat. That leads to unnecessary anxiety. And if there is, if that happens on a vulnerable individual who is genetically predisposed, 
that person might actually end up with anxiety disorders. Intolerance of uncertainties, hypersensitivity to body sensations. Now, let's say if we take a panic attack, initially we get the palpitations and the shortness of breath. And then when we start monitoring all these symptoms, oh my God, my heart is racing and I'm having difficulty in breathing. The oxygen is not enough. So we are monitoring our body and then we get fearful, worried over the symptoms that we are experiencing. And then the flight or flight mechanism or the stress response further worsens. Uh, worry is a major component because when we worry, particularly in anxiety disorders, we tend to worry about um, unnecessary things. We call it unproductive worry. There won't be an answer most of the time. The personality. If I'm an anxious avoidant person, I'm more prone to get anxiety disorders. Of course, the social factors, which most of the time, like we, we don't have any control over, like the early life experiences. If, there, if your father was not well throughout your childhood, you might be very conscious about, you know, and that might lead to health anxiety later on. Divorces, um, uh, stressful jobs can lead to uh, anxiety because you're always, like if the job, if the boss is uh, kind of harsh towards you, you are, and you're feeling, you're perceiving that job uh, boss as a threat. So anxiety comes up, social pressure, like I want you to get uh, highest marks of this exam. Most of the adolescents and the youth are undergoing this pressure, even though they cannot, they're, they're not in a state to study and they are at home and in, uh, doing online classes. The parents expect them to study all the time, which and only the student knows how difficult is it is to be in front of a laptop for five, six hours. Again, leads to anxiety. So the treatment um, is pharmacological. Basically, to, we are addressing the neurotransmitters there. And psychologically, psychological management should be there. And social management should be there. All these approaches should be there together. Otherwise, let's say if there is, if the wife is having anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, because he, she is getting, uh, she is facing domestic violence at home because the husband is using alcohol. Every time the husband is coming home, she would get panic attacks. So without eliminating that factor, domestic violence or without addressing the alcohol use of the husband, we might not be able to completely cure the wife's uh, generalized anxiety disorder. So that's why social approach uh, is also important when it comes to management of anxiety, for that matter, in most of the psychiatric conditions. Antidepressants are the mainstay, which I would talk about later on. Then the benzodiazepines, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, antihistamines uh, are used. What is very, very important is that it takes about one to two weeks for the antidepressants to come into play. So during this period, unless you educate the patient about it, the patient is going to go to another doctor and throw away the medications. And modest benefits are observed in six weeks' time. So it's kind of a long process. It's not going to be like taking two paracetamol and the fever coming down. And the side effects will be experienced early because the uh, upregulated serotonin receptors in the postsynaptic membranes. So the side effects will be experiencing way before the therapeutic effect, which is again a reason for dropout rates. And usually, unlike in depression, in anxiety disorders, you have to give about three months before change in the antidepressant. And at least six months, because, but usually, although we say at least six months, it's usually if you take a prototype patient, it goes beyond about one year. Psychological aspects. Now, most of the patients will come and ask for counseling. 
and anxiety disorder is a specific anxiety disorders are a specific group of disorders therefore counseling will not help but of course having said that there are other psychological methods which are very very effective which can be used alone also like cognitive behavior therapy which i'll be talking about later on i have spoken about the social uh, aspects of it so the first line of treatment for anxiety disorders also are antidepressants which i think is a take home message nothing as but if the patient is having severe enough symptoms to give a medication then it should be um antidepressants and the first line is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors so the ones which are available in sri lanka are fluoxetine sertraline escitalopram citalopram and fluoxamine out of which the green ones are available in the government sector and snris serotonin and noradrenaline i mentioned that these two uh, uh, neurotransmitters are implied in the causation of uh, anxiety disorders so venlafaxine and duloxetine are used out of that some of the hospitals might have duloxetine but venlafaxine is somewhat available so these medications are effective for generalized anxiety disorder social anxiety disorder and panic disorder not in specific phobias that is like arachnophobia fear of heights medications are not there so it's generalized anxiety disorder uh, uh social anxiety disorder and panic disorder and panic disorder can, uh, uh, also agoraphobia there is the, it further divides into agoraphobia with panic attacks and without panic attacks so in that case also we can use the ssris and i have mentioned the evidence the tricyclic antidepressants uh, what we have is imipramine amitriptyline and clomipramine can be used in panic disorder pd is panic disorder so they also serve the same purpose increasing the serotonin and the noradrenaline uh, at the cleft by uh, blocking the uh, transporters and it's effective for effective for generalized anxiety social anxiety and panic comparable efficacy to ssris then why are we not using it all that much we don't we do not see patients being prescribed tricyclic antidepressants mainly because of not because of efficacy but because of the side effect profiles because of the anticholinergic actions sometimes the sedation even imipramine is kind of sedative although amitriptyline is the one that is known to be causing sedation most so the side effect profile is the one which determines this as well as if there is associated depression uh, tcas are lethal in overdose agomelatine which is not really registered in sri lanka now it is being given as second line treatment in the world but in sri lanka we do not use that all that much in sri lanka we tend to use the ssris and venlafaxine most of the time phenylalanine monoamine oxidase inhibitor it is more effective in social anxiety but we tend not to use it uh, as well as mopramide because of the cheese reaction the adverse side effects that we expect if they take it with other uh, food and mirtazapine may have efficacy bupropion conflicting evidence uh, so out of these mirtazapine bupropion that's available in sri lanka in the private sector just um, wanted to give you an idea about the doses the starting doses i have mentioned here but usually for anxiety higher doses than that is used for depression is required so fluoxetine you might have to go for 40 or certainly in 250 at times but having said that if a patient is not getting um uh, better if the patient is not responding at fluoxetine 20 or certainly in around 150 200 or escitalopram around 20 mg or citalopram 40 i think it's time for you to refer to specialist services 
uh, to a psychiatrist. I think these patients should be managed by a psychiatrist because there might be something wrong which is happening. The diagnosis might be might need to be reviewed and so on. So same with venlafaxine, 75 can be the starting dose. The, high, uh, the maximum dose is about 300. But if the patient is not responding around 150, again, think twice. Tricyclics, we often see patients being prescribed 25 milligrams of imipramine, amitriptyline 12.5, 25. Yes, that is the sedative dose. But for depression, as well as anxiety, you need higher doses. Let's say the patient might need about 100 to 150 of uh, imipramine and amitriptyline about 100 to 150 because otherwise they're not going to respond. So please be mindful when you're prescribing TCAs because 12.5, 25, those doses are not going to be effective for depression or anxiety. But the problem is when you titrate the doses higher and higher, the patient is going to come up with the side effects. So that's why it's not used that much. Mertesapine, uh, 30, 45 milligrams. So um, you have to think twice if they're not responding. That's the take home message there. Um, when it comes to tolerability, as I mentioned earlier, uh, SSRIs are better tolerated. Gastrointestinal bleeding. I have just put an example here. I mean, we tend to prescribe fluoxetine very freely, uh, but that can cause gastrointestinal bleeding. So we have to be very mindful about it. We don't want to create problems when going to um, sort out the problem. Um, and particularly if the patient is on aspirin, warfarin, NSAIDs, then the bleeding risk is high. Um, and also, um, sexual side effects. This is something that we do not talk about. About 50 to 70% of people who are on SSRIs will experience sexual side effects. Another very common reason for dropouts. So we have to ask that. Hyponatremia, if a patient comes who is on fluoxetine or sertraline for anxiety disorders and the sodium is low, it's better depending on the clinical status of the patient to discontinue it. Um, and perhaps like go for something like mertesapine when you restart it because it have a lesser uh, probability of giving a uh, hyponatremia. Um, and discontinuation symptoms. Um, if a patient uh, who was well controlled, it might be panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder or depression even. Uh, if they come to you all of a sudden saying, now the patient is irritable and it's like having sweating, uh, headaches and sort of jittery. If the patient has been very well up to this point, first question that you have to ask is whether they have missed doses. Venlafaxine, because of its short half-life, is very, very notorious to create. It can turn the patient upside down and sometimes the discontinuation symptoms mimic anxiety symptoms. So sometimes we might increase the dose, but then actually what we need to do is check for the compliance and uh, uh, advise the patient accordingly. Um, something again, very important interactions. Um, SSRIs, although well, they are very tolerable, they are um, very prone to create problems because of interactions. Always check the common prescribed fluoxetine because of the liver enzymes can create problems. So if you're not sure, it's always better to check for interactions. Um, that stands for sertraline, fluoxetine, fluoxamine, almost all the SSRIs. Uh, moving on to the next category, which is the favorite among many. If a patient is having sleep issues or having some anxiety disorders, most of the time, alprazolam, clonazepam, these medications are prescribed. And apart from the anxiety disorder they might be having already, we are creating artogenic benzodiazepine dependence as well. Because let's say a patient comes to you with poor sleep and patient tells you that I'm having poor sleep, doctor. 
If we do not go into the history and prescribe aprazolam, the patient's sleep problem is never going to get better unless we have prescribed the proper medication, which is the SSRI or the TCA. So uh, that's the issue with benzodiazepines. Of course, benzodiazepine, although it's not considered the first-line monotherapy for anxiety disorders, it has it uses as an adjunct in short term. While waiting for the antidepressant to act within the two weeks, because the anxiety symptoms also might get worse and to calm down the patient, perhaps you can use a benzodiazepine there. And if it is mild and you expect the patient's anxiety symptoms to go away, you can use benzodiazepines there. And there are also aprazolam and clonazepam are better than lorazepam and diazepam. So for all the anxiety disorders, yes, benzodiazepines has a role to play, but short term. And it's no longer considered the first line uh, uh, monotherapy for anxiety disorders. Buspiron is an azathioprine, and uh, that is effective for generalized anxiety disorder. Not available in the government uh, sector, but it is available in the private sector. Um, it is used as an adjunctive treatment with SSRIs and SNRIs. It is used in Sri Lanka. Moving on to antipsychotics, cotyapine has evidence and uh, particularly in generalized anxiety disorder, even as monotherapy. However, you have to weigh the benefits and the risks here because we know a lot of patients who are having anxiety disorders belong to the young adults and it's the young adults who are more prone to develop metabolic side effects due to second generation antipsychotics. Contrary to popular belief, it's not the elderly uh, people who are more prone to get uh, metabolic syndrome with second generation antipsychotics. So when there is SSR, when there are SSRIs, uh, you have to think twice unless you are using it as an augmentation agent or an adjunct, uh, whether I should be really using cotapine or in certain instances, olanzapine, aripiprazole, risperidone, or this medication also can be used mostly in treatment resistant anxiety disorders to augment the effect. Pregabalin has strong evidence now, and it is being used in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, not so much with gabapentin. So, pre but the issue with pregabalin again is potential for abuse and dependence. And we do see patients who are having pregabalin dependence, and also patients abuse this in the community also. So we have to keep these things also in mind when we are prescribing. Propanolol is commonly used, particularly for social anxiety disorder and performance anxiety, but it has no evidence. But perhaps for a task-specific anxiety, like, you know, before going to the exam or something like that, but not as a long-term management strategy. Clonidine, uh, same, but it's not used to be, uh, uh, not found to be really useful. And you can think why they are using propanolol and clonidine because of the adrenergic effects. Antihistamines, hydroxyzine, not very much, not at all used in Sri Lanka for the management of anxiety disorders, but um, it is FDA approved. Particularly, uh, there is a place because most of the people are like scared to use other medications on children and pregnant women. So there is the postulation that this might be, uh, this has a place there. But having said that, um, antidepressants like sertraline, fluoxetine, acetylopam can be used safely in pregnancy and lactation. There are the novel therapies. We are at which are at the experimental stages, serotonergic agonist, and also like, you know, although I said experimental stages, some of the drugs like novel antidepressants like vortiostatine, they have been used. So still the evidence is not very strong. 
and uh, glutamate modulators because it's closely linked to dopamine system and so on. So decycloserine, a partial agonist, um, uh, which can be used in phobias. So neuropeptides, all these things are being tested, but not real strong evidence as for antidepressants and uh, as for um, pregabaline or antipsychotics as adjuncts. Moving on to the psychological management, I thought that uh, the lifestyle changes, I thought I would put it first because it reduces your chances of getting into an anxiety state. Because if you are like only working about concentrating about your work and you have no life beyond that, that stresses you out. That gives you a lot of anxiety, which might ultimately lead to anxiety disorders. So stress is a part of life. So we have to aim for a stressless and balanced life. That's why we talk about work-life balance as well. So it's time you have to um, allocate time for exercise, sports, leisure activities, even sex, and to create happiness, dietary changes. All these things are simple things that we, anybody can do, although we don't do it. And also, avoiding psychoactive substances. That is also very, very important. So those are general things that anybody can do. Self-help is afford for mild forms. Uh, there, there are various written materials and so on which can be used. And the therapist input is minimal. It's basically self-guided by a, so, um, it's self-help guided by a trained uh, practitioner. Not very much available in Sri Lanka though. Um, behavioral techniques are there, the relaxation therapies. Uh, it's useful for sub states of anxiety, stress-related disorders uh, as an initial uh, way of treating it. Uh, there is progressive muscular relaxation, breathing techniques, and it can be used in anxiety disorders with good effects. And particularly if you combine it, like panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, if you're combining it with medications, it would give good effects. So this is progressive muscular relaxation, how you can do it. You tense it and then release it. That's you alternatively do it. And then the breathing exercises, which anybody can do while even while listening to a lecture or while doing something. And without you knowing it, it brings down your anxiety. Going on to psychological management proper, cognitive behavior therapy. It can be used as cognitive therapy alone where you change the cognitions. Behavior therapy alone uh, where you change the behaviors or it can be given as a combined therapy, as cognitive behavior therapy. So let's say a patient is having a specific pho phobia. A patient is like, you know, is very, very scared of spiders. So you expose that patient to the spider in a gradual way. But it has to be prolonged and adequate, it has to be repeated as well, at least about 45 minutes. So let's say I'm fearful of spiders. Uh, first, I can start looking, be sort of graded. I can start looking at a picture of a spider. Then I can uh, look at a video of a spider on TV. And then perhaps you can look at a, a, a dead spider. So you just gradually introduce, uh, you expose to the avoided uh, stimuli. And later on, make the patient realize when you are exposed to this particular stimuli that the stress or the anxiety level goes away. So these are the types of exposure therapy that is there. You can uh, do it real life, like the spider. Or it could be imagined, like let's say if you're fearing um, flying, you can ask the patient to imagine it. Or now we have the very sophisticated ones like the virtual reality. So you can be exposed uh, like that. And then particularly like in episodes where in panic attacks, you get the patient to have a panic attack, 
So you get the patient to experience all the sensations. And then, uh, because a patient who is having a panic attack thinks that it's going to be harmful and that this particular physical symptoms is going to make you die. That's the kind of fear that they have. So you sort of get them to experience that symptom and get them to experience that you're not going to die just because you have palpitations. So that's called interoceptive uh, exposure, which is particularly good in panic attacks. So generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, panic disorders, cognitive behavior therapy can be used. And I would give you an example. In cognitive behavior therapy, there, is the, there are the thoughts, the feelings and emotions, and the behaviors. Now, I get the thought that something bad is going to happen. So I get anxious, scared, increased heart rate, and I leave that situation and ask for a friend for reassurance. So I get the thoughts, the fear of fear. You get scared and you're scared of the fear also. And then you get the fear of symptoms, increased heart rate, you feel palpitations and you think you're getting a heart attack. And then negative evaluation, like, you know, that people might think badly. Now I'm doing the presentation now. And like, if I start thinking that everybody is going to think bad of me and that I did a bad lecture or a presentation, that is going to cause anxiety. So that's why in um, cognitive behavior therapy, we tend to um, uh, correct the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Like here, this is a simplified version. So the palpitations following stressful interactions. So there's a perceived threat. There is something wrong with my body. Now in here, if we get the patient to get a panic attack and make them realize that this is not going to do anything, this is just a symptom or a perception, then that fear is going to get reduced. And if that uh, fear is going to be reduced, the anxious arousal is not going to happen. And then something bad is happening. I could be having a heart attack. That thought can be corrected as well. So behavioral uh, and the cognitive approaches all are integrated in cognitive behavior therapy. But however, we have to keep in mind there is a particular model for social anxiety disorder that we need to think of. And you have to apply that model when you're doing cognitive behavior therapy for social anxiety disorders. Same with panic disorder. Panic disorder, there is the Clark's model for panic disorder. So you have to apply that where the, the cognitions that you get are different in different anxiety disorders. Psychodynamic psychotherapy, not very much practiced in Sri Lanka as opposed to cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, the patients who have pre-existing problems in the childhood, like early childhood, interpersonal relationships. So it's, uh, you can talk and then like, you know, um, sort of, tease out the uh, psychodynamics there and try to interpret why this person is experiencing this at, at this point based on the previous experiences. This is very time consuming and trained therapists are needed. So not very much practice. And anyways, like cognitive behavior therapy, it's not first line for anxiety disorders. And you have to select the suitable patients there. Right, so after talking about the available options and everything, let's go to case scenario one. 30 year old female presents to you with headaches. She was treated for gastritis for five years intermittently. So she, the information that we should obtain, she comes out if we ask only, because most of the time they're not going to tell us this, they are only going to talk about the physical symptom. She worries about her finances, family, has difficulty falling asleep and complains of raising heart, heartbeat, difficulty in breathing. These symptoms are present almost daily, most of the time of the day. Unless we ask, the patient would not know this. What they know of from their level is headaches as well as perhaps the gastritis. But if we have been experiencing anxiety symptoms for a long time, we know stress, stress and gastritis is interrelated and patient would get treated for headache and for the gastritis. But 
both of that will not get cured because the generalized anxiety is, uh, is going on. And just treating generalized anxiety disorder might not be enough because the husband is violent and consumes alcohol. So that's where the uh, psychosocial management is also important. Case scenario number two. The 25-year-old female second-year medical student getting anxious closer to the exam. Sometimes we might be uh, forced to prescribe some propranolol or benzodiazepine. And then with the increased frequency of exams, the patient, the student might end up benzodiazepine dependent. However, if it is not bothering her all that much, it might be her personality and that might be the thing that drives her to study. And if the exams are okay, if you take a little bit of history in the past, then this does not need any particular management. So we don't have to do anything here. Perhaps give some supportive psychotherapy. So you support as to what to do and that this is a normal phenomena and that you have to get used to it. That might calm her down. A very common presentation, they might, they, sometimes these patients end up getting nebulized also. And then like, you know, because at that point, what patient says is these two physical symptoms. But if there have been previous such episodes, and particularly in panic attacks, they get this thought that they're going to die or that they're going to go crazy. And here, the uncle has died of a heart attack. So in panic disorders, although we say that uh, there is no specific trigger, if you really, because when you get the panic attack, there is no such trigger. But then if you really talk to the patient, there might be some stressor in the background. Often they might be depressed also. Eight-year-old child presenting with nocturnal aneurysis for three months duration. This was since the start of the new year and has been complaining that his teacher is very strict. So there is a reluctancy to go to school, a school phobia or rather teacher phobia. So you might need to address the problems that's going on there. Might not even need any medication. Fifth one. So although the patient comes and tells you that he is not able to achieve an erection. Morning erections are present and he can masturbate. And if you really talk to the patient, only he will come out with this, that he's worried about performance, performance anxiety. Just talking to the patient and taking out what is there might relieve the anxiety and you might be successful in treating the issue here. But if you go for something like sildenafil, it's going to be long lasting and the patient is on medications. And it would attach stigma, all these issues, and then later on uh, issues between the couple. All of these would have been prevented. Uh, would have been, the patient would have got a better deal if the symptoms were analyzed a little bit further. Because in Sri Lanka, um, these psychological phenomena and the physical symptoms uh, coming as presentations of psychiatric illness is very alien. They tend to somatize. Even if they're depressed, they would come and tell, I'm having a headache. So the focus is on the symptoms. And uh, uh, there, when the patients also uh, stress very much importance in the physical symptoms, in RBC settings, we also tend to focus on that and the therapeutic approach is going to go to another direction. Uh, so that's why most of these patients, like patients with shortness of breath, palpitation would come to the cardiologist. Gastric symptoms would come to the gastroenterologist. Headaches to the neurologist. Se sexual problems to the VOG. So it's our role to really identify because the, most of the time, we get referrals from all the other specialities when it comes to anxiety symptoms, because partly because the patients are coming to those uh, 
uh, areas. So anxiety disorders are very common. So if you, you have to talk to the patient and elicit the symptoms to know uh, that this is an anxiety disorder, unless you include it at the initial differential diagnosis list, let's say in the headache, if you do not think of anxiety, generalized anxiety uh, at that level, it might never enter into the uh, diagnosis or to the differential diagnosis list until everything else is excluded and the patient has gone from a place to another, to another, to a doctor and so on. And also the important thing is there are effective therapeutic interventions that can be taken. Uh, so the patients do well with the medications and, uh, and also the psychological approaches. And it should be a holistic management, which includes not only pharmacological therapy, psychological and social measures as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chaturi, for that uh, excellent lecture covering uh, the uh, management, uh, the therapeutic approaches to anxiety disorders. I think it's a very uh, current topic and uh, you gave some uh, case scenarios and how to address those as well. I, I believe that this would have been a very uh, useful um, uh, uh, presentation uh, for the audience. Uh, I would like to um, uh, ask any, if there are any questions, I'm sure Chatri will be able to uh, uh, handle those questions. Are there any questions that you want to ask uh, Dr. Chatri Suravira uh, on, on what she presented? You can put any questions onto the chat forum if needed. Uh, if not, uh, I think you can... Uh, uh, you know, switch on your mic and ask us questions. Yeah. I think your lecture was uh, extremely useful. So, uh, so therefore, uh, probably, uh, you know, there aren't uh, uh, very many, qu uh, you know, questions uh, in, in the minds. Uh, can I ask a, a question, Chaturi? Now, uh, I think particularly when we are trying to treat these are experienced, particularly by the adolescent and the young people, uh, uh, we see that, you know, in our students as well. Uh, but particularly in the adolescents, one concern, now, if you consider the pharmacological management, first line would be, uh, the SSRIs. Uh, so there is concern about, uh, you know, increased suicidal tendencies. Um, so, so what is your, uh, you know, advice on that? You know, considering that, what would be the, uh, you know, uh, best option, and and uh, uh, how how should we address that question, please? Yes. Thank you, Madam. Yes, uh, that is a concern uh, where the suicidality can increase with adolescents and young adults. Uh, that's why uh, when particularly when uh, treating the adolescents, it's always best that they can, if they can be managed by a child and adolescent psychiatrist or a psychiatrist, because we don't have many psych uh, child and adolescent psychiatrists in Sri Lanka. But having said that, if we decide to start the treatment on a patient, uh, then which means that we have to consider the risks and the benefits of that patient. I mean, we... Um, uh, we consider to start the um, medication because the patient is basically now dysfunctional. So there we might, uh, because it's the, there are issues about the studies also which brought out this conclusion where that probably about the sampling and the study methodology there. So considering all of that, and we usually like, you know, in our experience, we don't see that much in our part of the world as well. So considering all of that, it's always best to advise the parents. And also uh, the, there is a risk of increasing sort of um, hyper, um, so, sort of activation-like symptoms. So sometimes we uh, prescribe a little bit of risperidone. Uh, and sometimes if, we are, uh, if the anxiety is going to increase, we might prescribe a little bit of small doses of benzodiazepines. So those measures also can counteract those risks but then it's always best to advise the parents about it without alarming them. 
Uh, okay, Th thank you, Chatur. Yes, I think this is uh, one of the concerns that uh, you know uh, people worry about because this is um, just anxiety disorder and it's not like depression as such. And so we give a antidepressant and then whether that can uh, you know promote um, uh, you know suicidal thoughts and so on is I think one concern that people have. Um, yes, uh, so I think uh, in the uh, interest of time as well, uh, we can uh, conclude this session if there are no uh, further uh, questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we will have this, uh, uh, this session was recorded and, and uh, we will uh, have it, uh, uh, you know, available uh, for the others to view because I think today, uh, you know, at this current time, people are probably in <laughs> uh, queues uh, to get full. Uh, and rather than addressing, uh, you know, attending uh, lectures. Uh, but I think it's a very important topic in this current time. And I'm so thankful to you, Chaturi, for accepting our invitation and doing an excellent job of it, uh, uh, giving a very uh, uh, comprehensive update on uh, how to uh, manage uh, anxiety disorders. So it's my pleasure uh, to um, give you this, uh, you know, certificate of, uh, you know, as a resource person. And I thank you on behalf of the CLMA and the Medicinal Drugs Committee for doing this lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll be closing the session. Thank you. Thank you.